I'm very glad that you could all come out tonight. I will make note to myself to try not to be boring. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, I first want to take the opportunity to recognize my uh, dissertation supervisor, Dr. Jiaping uh, uh, Chu, uh, who is with us tonight. Uh, he has played an instrument, instrumental role in the evolution of this, this research. And I thank him for his patience, his support, and his guidance. And tonight we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the interaction at target firms between activist hedge funds and traditional institutional investors such as pension funds and insurance companies, banks, mutual funds, endowments, people like that. Um, and, and while hedge funds are often associated with U.S. markets, uh, th this type of shareholder engagement has actually become very widespread in Canada. And in the last year alone, there are, are many examples, and I've just picked a few. Uh, Jana Partners, a, a hedge fund, uh, announced uh, uh, that it had taken a large ownership or an ownership position in Agrium, which is a fertilizer producer out of Calgary, Alberta. Uh, and they led a hostile proxy battle, uh, trying to elect five uh, uh, members to the, to the board of directors. And while they, they failed in that attempt, they still hold a 7.5% share in Agrium, and they work on corporate governance issues trying to improve the, the, uh, the operations of that firm. Uh, another one, Samara Capital, uh, which is uh, a small cap metal exploration company that's involved in, in looking for, for things like zinc. They were targeted by, um, uh, no, the Selwyn Resources is the small uh, cap metal firm. Selwyn Capital is the, the hedge fund. Uh, Selwyn is out of Vancouver. And they were successful in electing three uh, members to the, the board of directors and have a stated goal of challenging and changing the business operations of Selwyn Resources to improve value for shareholders. Uh, and then in June, Scout Capital announced a 5.5% ownership share in, in Tim Hortons. And they believe that there is opportunity to, to improve shareholder value by by changing the way that Tim Hortons is, is running. Specifically, they call for uh, a pullback from the expansion into the US to take on more debt and to, to go through with uh, share buybacks. And, and what's interesting about this one is that this comes on the heels of another hedge fund who made a similar run at Tim Hortons. So Highfields, who now has a 4% share in Tim Hortons, was asking for uh, exactly the same thing. So very active. and. Uh, and even two weeks ago, Carl Icahn uh, announced that he had acquired a, a 6% share in Talisman Energy out of Calgary. Uh, he made the announcement via Twitter, uh, no less, and the, and the markets responded immediately. So a, a huge jump in price immediately. Uh, but market sense and restraint sort of took place and the, the share price dropped back. But this one was a little different than, than other campaigns that I've seen. Uh, because at Talisman, the, the CEO there is a gentleman by the name of, of uh, Hal Quisley, who is very, very well respected in the industry, ex-CEO of uh, TransCanada. And he has been working a turnaround plan at Talisman over the past year. And I think the markets rightly looked at this and said, what else can Carl Icahn do over and above the already active agenda that's taking place at Talisman anyway? But perhaps the, the most famous one in Canada, and one that illustrates a lot of what I'm doing in my research, is uh, what has happened uh, at Canadian Pacific. And, um, and, and I have uh, sort of a, a vested interest, or I had a vested interest in this one as well. Uh, because throwing caution to the wind on March 11th, I think it was, 2011, uh, I bought shares of CP at $62. And I ignored everything I had learned about diversified portfolios and trying to time markets. Um, and I thought, uh, 62 looked good. It was toying with 52-week lows. There had been a rundown in price, and I bought in. Um, and I'm a student. I took a considerable amount of money for me, anyway, and locked it into, into CP. Um, and was very much reminded of my prowess at picking stocks over the next six months. <laughs> And by September, share price had plummeted, and I was not feeling too good about my investing abilities. Uh, and then there was uh, an announcement. Uh, in early October, hedge fund Pershing Square Capital Management made an announcement that it had taken an ownership position in CP. 
And uh, managers, hedge fund managers such as um, um, Bill Ackman have taken on near mythical um, reputations in certain circles. And depending on your perspective, you either view them as forces of good or agents from the dark side, but, but, but nobody has a neutral position on some of these managers. Uh, and the market responded um, favorably when he made public uh, announcements about his intentions to work with management and board at CP to improve the operating performance uh, of the company. Um, and at the announcement of 5% uh, uh, ownership uh, in CP, share price jumped to 65. Um, immediately, I was back in the black and feeling a little bit better about myself. Um, and over the next couple of months, nothing really seemed to be happening. Things were going on in private, but the market price kind of floated around and, and not a whole lot was happening and I got nervous and on December the 13th or thereabouts I sold my interest at $64.76, uh, had a 4% uh, capital gain on that one, two dividend payments, I licked my wounds and thought ah, at least I got out of this one alive. And I really, really, really wish that I had done the order of my research for the dissertation in a different order. I was working on executive compensation at the time, not hedge funds, because had I been doing this work, my decision-making process would have been entirely different. Um, throughout the fall of, of 2011, the relationship between Ackman and the, the chairman of the board at uh, CP, John, John uh, Cleghorn, it, it, it increasingly soured and became more and more hostile, culminating in what eventually became a public email that Ackman sent to Cleghorn. Um, um, and, and I'm going to share a little bit of this email with you. The entire email is long, so I'm not going to go through it all, but it highlights some really important things that take place when hedge funds get involved in an activist campaign. Um, and, and what's really interesting as well, if you Google it all, you can get the whole email chain. So you can see what Ackman said, you can see how Cleghorn responded. So if you've got the time, it's really kind of interesting to take a look at it. Um, but I will share parts of it with you. So this was sent in the early hours of January the 4th, 2012. To John Cleghorn, subject, war and peace. When a border skirmish takes place, sometimes it leads to full out war and other times borders are redrawn and peace can be, uh, remain in both lands. The choices from here as I see them are one, representatives from your side and our side sit down and work this out promptly. Working it out, in my view, is the quick addition of two representatives from our side to the board and Hunter's hiring as CEO. Hunter is Hunter Harrison, ex-CEO of arch rival Canadian National Railroad. Uh, the second alternative is that we will be forced to launch a proxy contest for the upcoming annual meeting where we will seek to replace a greater number of uh, the existing uh, directors with highly regarded business executives who share our belief that management and the board change is necessary at CP. In the proxy contest, as a first step, we will take the largest public hall you have available in Toronto and we will make a presentation to shareholders and to the public about management and board failure over the last 10 years at CP. The proxy contest will not go well for the board or for Fred. Fred would be Fred Green, the CEO of CP at the time. The track record is very poor, shareholders are disgruntled, and we are offering an alternative with a legendary reputation. An analyst at Morgan Stanley, your advisor in this matter, is now writing of Super Bowl if Hunter is hired. Don't rely on my opinion on this, just ask your proxy advisors. War is not my preference. It has been extremely rare for us. We have only had two proxy contests in 25 or so active engagements in public companies over the past eight years. Let's avoid having a border skirmish turn into a nuclear winter. Life is too short. Sincerely, Bill. <laughs> True to his word, Ackman uh, set about work on the proxy battle taking full advantage of extensive media campaign. 
On May the 12th, about five days before uh, the, the annual meeting, the Globe and Mail reported that the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board has backed activist investor Bill Ackman's entire slate of nominees at Canadian Pacific Railway Limited and withheld uh, votes from the incumbent directors at the railroad. So suddenly you've got other institutional investors stepping in and giving support to what's happening. And then on May 17th, at the annual meeting, um, there was a successful proxy contest that resulted in seven. So he w was looked for two, he got seven board seats on the board directors, including Ackman himself. Uh, and then the board quickly pursued, they ousted Fred Green from the position, installed Hunter Harrison as the new CEO, and gave him the mandate of improving operational efficiency at CP. <laughs> in April 2013, CPR announced its best quarterly results in its 132 year history. Share price peaked a little after that at over $142, and by that time, Pershing Square had built what started as a 5% position up to 14.2%. They owed 24 million shares, which at that time were now worth $3.4 billion. And as a testament to the ability of hedge funds to move financial markets, on June 3rd, Pershing Square and Ackman put out an announcement saying that they planned to lower their ownership position to 10% and the market responded. So up, and then, and they weren't saying they were bailing, they were saying we're gonna take it from 14 down to 10. Still having a strong position, and yet the market just responded like that. Uh, since then, share price has subsequently rebounded, and then yesterday, the news came out, and it's a little hard for you to see. But once again, CP Rail posts its record third quarter, so once again, best of all time um, and we've got a situation here where they've done exactly what they said their their uh, profit was a hundred a dollar 88 per share on an estimate of a dollar 72 but the key thing here is they've taken their operating ratio which was in the 80 some positions in the old days down to the mid 60s so operating ratio you want it to be lower that's a, a sign that you're running effectively uh, the CN version, I think, is in the high 50s. But the point is, is that there's been this huge turnaround at, at CP. And I don't know if you were watching yesterday, but uh, this is what happened. So on news of that, share price jumped over 10%, uh, $13.79 per share. It went over $150 a share. It closed at $148.53 yesterday. This is what hedge funds can do. And, and this is what I would call a classic example of hedge funds creating value by aligning support from other institutional investors to have an agenda focused on improving value at the target firm, which ultimately shows up in increased share price. So that leads us to kind of the, the research. So, so there's a lot of what I've talked about that we'll come back and, and reflect on when I talk about a little bit about how, how my research has, has come along. So, so the intent of my, my research is to look at the corporate governance implications of the interaction between hedge funds and traditional institutional investors. And, and this is important to, to me, to academics, for a number of reasons. Uh, but. Uh, Probably the, the, the biggest reason it's important is there's been a real shift in the investor activism um, world in, in which hedge funds have emerged as the dominant force engaging in shareholder activism. That is coming in trying to make changes at a company to influence the company to do something to increase share price. And in the mid 80s, it was pension funds that did this. And that's changed entirely and, and, and hedge funds have, have taken over. But there's been no research or no paper that's looked at the interaction between hedge funds and other institutional investors. Um, and it could be important um, for a number of reasons. On, on one hand, um, hedge funds are very different than traditional institutional investors. They are subject to lower levels of regulation, both political and, 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 and by law. Uh, and that may make them more effective at engaging in governance activities that can, can translate into improved performance that ends up causing shareholders to, to, to have higher valuations. Um, 
But on the, on the other side of things, they, they, don't take, they don't strive to get a majority position. They, they take relatively small ownership positions, so five, seven and a half, whatever it might be. But they need the support of other institutional investors if they're going to push through on these activist agendas. Um, so, so what I'm trying to do is to, to, to look at the, the interaction between these two and, and to, to see what comes out of that. Um, and what I do is, is I ask a number of questions. I say, do hedge funds target firms that have high levels of institutional ownership? And if they do, do they have a preference from institutional investors that have a short-term time horizon or a long-term time horizon? And then from the flip side, I say, what do these institutional investors think when the hedge fund arrives? Do they like it? Do they not like it? Um, and how do they trade? Can we pick up information on their trading behavior to try to determine whether or not these two are acting as, as partners or as, as adversaries? So that's, that's what I'm looking at in, in, in the research. The, the question for this group might be, well, why should you care? Um, and, and the answer might be that this research might give you some ideas on investing strategies that you can take advantage of what's going on in the world to come up with, with, with ways that you can invest to take advantage of what hedge funds are doing. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Just to kind of set things up, hedge funds, I'm sure people have a pretty good idea, but it's always worth talking about sort of the basics. So a hedge fund is a private, actively managed investment fund. Usually they're set up as limited partnerships. Um, they are subject by design for light regulation. So, so the securities world is kind of driven by some, some very old laws and a few new ones. So you've got the securities legislation that took place in the 1933, 1934, and then investment company uh, legislation that took place in the 1940s. There were rules and there were exceptions that were established way back then. Um, and you could avoid regulation if you followed certain rules. So if you limited the number of investors to less than 100, or if you only sold your pro product to qualified or accredited uh, investors, then you weren't subject to the same scrutiny or the same types of rules. So you could start to, you could, you could leverage higher. You didn't have to necessarily maintain a certain level of diversification. So, so by design to give them flexibility, hedge funds are lightly regulated and they're not sold to the general public. Um, as it turns out, institutional investors are the biggest investors in hedge funds. They own about 60% of all hedge funds under assets under management at hedge funds um, in, the, in the US. Um, but it's that and high net worth individuals that are the prime investors. But by the end of the talk tonight, you're going to see why what hedge funds are doing is actually important to people in this room and to typical Canadians. Um, the managers almost always have a significant amount of their personal wealth tied up in their funds. So these people care about the performance of, of the fund. The funds are designed to make absolute returns. And if they do a bad job in doing what they're supposed to, they're going to hurt not only on the fees that they don't earn, but they, they will hurt because their personal wealth is at stake, at, at stake as well. The fees are big, but, and they're based on performance. So a typical fee structure for a hedge fund is a 2% assets under management. If you talk to somebody in, in a hedge fund, they'll say that's just for administrative purposes. The real fee structure comes in that they'll take uh, typically 20% of all profits above a threshold level, and then they make it a high watermark. So if they lose money next year, then they've got to get above that again. But, but they're taking a substantial chunk of the profits. Um, so when you're comparing whether or not it's a good investment for, for a qualified investor, you need to look at what is the performance after fees. And sometimes it's actually really good. Um, and they focus on a number of different investment strategies, and, and some are global, macro. The ones that, that I'm interested in, where these, these activist hedge funds fit, is in a category of hedge funds called event-driven hedge funds. So some of them focus on, on, on specific things, mergers and acquisitions or distressed debt, or they, they, they focus on engaging in shareholder activism to make changes to cause the share price to go up. So that's the part of the hedge fund world that I'm, I'm looking at. But all parts of hedge funds have grown rapidly, grown rapidly since, since the 1990s. So that kind of sets the stage for, for what we're talking about here. My source data uh, from the results that I'm going to show you uh, comes from a, a number of sources, but the, the big ones goes back to the, to the, the um, 1934 Securities Exchange Act legislation says that 
If you take an ownership position of greater than 5% in any publicly traded firm, and you have any intention of influencing management, you gotta tell us about it. That's what the rule says. And, and what it is, you have to disclose that fact. Within 10 days, you have to say how much you bought, so what is your investment in that firm, and, and, uh, and what is it that you're planning to do with that investment. Uh, and this is called a, a Schedule 13D filing or a 13D filing. So I went back and collected, a, or I had access to a bunch of information that was collected about 13D filings over the, between 1997 and 2007. Um, and, and, um, and, and the 13D filing is a really good proxy for when this information becomes publicly known. Because when a 13D is filed, um, it gets filed with the SEC, it goes to every exchange on which the company is traded, and a copy of it goes to the company itself. So this information is out as soon as the 13D is filed. So, so I use that as my activism date in the research that I'm doing. And then on the institutional investor side of things, I'm interested in their trading behaviors. And if you're an institutional investor with more than $100 million worth of assets, you have to file a quarterly report with the SEC, which tells everything that you've got. So you can look at sequential quarterly reports and figure out the trading that each of the institutional investors are doing. And I come up with a way to figure out whether their investment focus is short-term horizon or, or long-term horizon. But all this information is publicly and readily available. And and then for the regressions that I do, I, I go and get company information as well. But that's, that's the basis of where I get this information. I end up with 613, uh, 613 uh, Schedule 13D filings. So those are my events that take place. Um, and they take place between 1997 and 2007. On average, for this particular sample, the initial holdings of the hedge funds are about 7.5%. And you'll notice that it grows over time. So they don't buy in and just hold. Very much like that CP example, the, 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 the CP, when, when Bill Ackman went in, Pershing Square increased from just over 5% to almost, well, to over 14% in the time that he was holding. So they intend to invest more as, as time goes along as well. Uh, so this is, is just a summary of information that comes straight from, from the, the 13 Ds. So we, we find out what the objectives are and then what the tactics are. So, so sometimes it's pretty vague. Sometimes it just says, well, general undervaluation. And that happens in almost half of the cases. And this is a case where they're buying it because it looks like this firm really should be worth more than it is. And then there are a series of other ones. I'm particularly interested in the governance side of things. But governance falls into a bunch of categories. It can be related to executive compensation or takeover defenses. I was interested very much in what's going on at the board, whether there's fair representation, and whether or not we're talking about making changes with either the chair or the, the CEO. And then linking that to how are those go governance changes going to change the the operations of the, the target company, uh, and then ultimately cause share price to go up. So, so these are, are the objectives, and then there are a bunch of tactics. And I've got these listed in sort of increasing level of hostility. But what you'll find out is that a lot of activism is not particularly hostile. The change is going to happen through communication with the board of directors. That's what Ackman started to do in the fall, and it didn't get anywhere. And what you find very often is things start to, to escalate. They'll try to get board representation without going to a boat. So we could just get the company to get on side with what the new plan is going to be. Um, but then things can get hostile. It can be a threat of either a lawsuit or a proxy fight. So, so in corporations, when you're looking at your investments, you kind of got three things that you can do. You can, you can sell if you don't like what's going on. Um, you can vote your shares or you can sue. So if you're going to engage in activism, it's going to fall to one of the two. It's going to be either done through votes or through suing. Um, so you can threaten to do either or you can lead proxy contests. And that's exactly what happened in, in CP. And then I, I classify some can be either. But the more I look at it is when you get into public letters and shareholder proposals and media campaigns, they are getting more hostile as time goes along. So there's a, a natural progression. But the point is, is that lots of times it can be handled without becoming hostile and still have the desired effects that we're trying to see. So that's information that comes straight from the sample that, that I was looking at. 
First finding I want to talk about is, do these guys make money? Do they create value? So the first thing that, that I find when I look at all of this is that hedge funds generate abnormal returns that do not reverse over time. And the implication of that is that that tells us that, that, that activist agendas are value creating. And the argument is fairly simple. I mean, if it, if it was just manipulation, any blip in the share price, would the market would finally get it right and the share price would come back down and it would stay down. But if you're truly creating value over the long term, that's going to be reflected in long term increases in price. So, so the way I, I went about looking at this, it's pretty common in, in academic circles. We do what are called event studies. And I did a short run event study and a long run event study. Um, and the event is the filing of the 13D statement. So this is when the world learns that an activist is now active at a, at a particular target firm. Uh, and that's what I'm calling this event date. Um, and, and then what we've got is an estimation period, because what I'm interested in is abnormal returns. So over and above what the market tells us should have happened in this time frame, how much more did we get out of it because of, of the activism? So, so I have this estimation window where I look at the particular firm and come up with an, uh, an estimate of its sensitivity to market changes. So, so if you have a, uh, a stock that's more sensitive overall than a market, I would get a factor that I would apply to the market changes that happen inside my event window to tell me what should have happened. And then I take the additional return that I get and I call that the abnormal return. So anything that I show you tonight is over and above what the market's delivering anyway. Um, so, so I set this up and then I take a look at a window. What happened to share price and as it turns out the trading volume in the minus 20 to plus 20 win uh, window, uh, day window around the, the, the filing. And this is what we see. So over on the far side, this talks about uh, the abnormal trading levels. Uh, this is 250% of normal. This is 300% of normal. And what you can find is that the price starts to increase between 10 days um, and, and the actual date. And you see a lot of heavy trading taking place in that time period between minus 10 and zero. So what's going on there is somebody's selling and the hedge fund is buying. So this is all the activity that's taking. And what we find is that very often these hedge funds load up their position. It's not like they were buying a little bit at a time trying to build the position. They go full bore in that period right prior to when they go. So they'll collect most of that 5% or whatever, whatever position they're going for in that 10 days before they file the, the, SE, uh, the, the 13D. And what you can see, you start to see a, a run up in price. It goes up about 3% prior to the date. In the day of and the day after the event, you get another 2%. And in the subsequent days, it, it goes up even more. And over the entire 40-day uh, window, uh, it went up about 7.5%. If I extend it out to 40 days, it goes to 8.1. But we get significant abnormal returns happening in the short run around the filing of the of the uh, of the 13D statement, so we get abnormal returns. So, so and and this would be consistent if hedge funds were manipulative or if they're value creating. If they're manipulative, they're going to do something to cause share price to bump. They're going to bail early and then go. So this one doesn't tell us that they're value creating, but it certainly says that the market is responding favorably to what's going on. I then wanted to see, well, what happens over the longer term? Because we're interested, because markets will get things right if you give the market enough time. So, so over a long period of time, do we see that we continue to have abnormal returns? Um, so what I do in this one is, uh, when you go to, 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 to long run uh, abnormal returns, I use something called the buy and hold abnormal return. What that means is if I bought it today and I held it until a certain day in the future, what is my return over and above what the market's going to give me? So this is a standard way of looking at things. And I take a look at, once again, the SEC 13D filing is the event date that I have. But I look at this abnormal return between 12 months before and 24 months after. And this is what we see. So things are going along merrily till about six months or so before the, the hedge fund decides to get in. And when you think about it, what's going on is these hedge funds are evaluating all kinds of potential targets. They're looking at information available, trying to decide who is a good person or a good company to, to target. Um, 
And then they, they, they watch what's happening, and, and there's typically a drop-off in price of about 5% in the six months before the event occurs. And then that sharply reverses right around the time of, of the activism event. And from there, we get a strong upward abnormal return, once again, over and above what the market is delivering, out to about 20 months. And overall, your distance between here and here is sort of a 20% plus abnormal return that you're seeing on this whole sample of, of hedge funds that, that I've been looking at. So, so I've got two things. I've got short-term abnormal returns and I've got long-term abnormal returns. And then the other thing I was interested in is, well, okay, it's all right if they're making extra money, but if the volatility, if it becomes much more risky to own that stock, then maybe it's not such a good thing for me to do. So, so I took a look at, at the volatility, and what I'm showing here is, is variance. If you're more used to thinking in standard deviations, you just take the square root of that. And at first blush, I was a little concerned because I saw that, indeed, after the activism event, I was seeing an increase in the variance. But then I got to thinking about the dates of my sample. And uh, the last event that I have is September, or December 26, uh, 2007, so before the financial crisis. But if I look at the two-year window after that, that's certainly when the financial crisis was in full bore. And it wasn't just targets of hedge funds that were showing volatility. It was every stock that was traded anywhere in the world. So, so when I looked at that, I said, in fairness, I'm skewing the result because I have no effect of the financial crisis on anything that's pre-event, and it's all built into to after. So when I remove those samples from, from my overall sample, I end up showing that there is no increase in volatility. And, and when you think about it, you've got to be careful of your numbers not to get misled into concluding something that really isn't true. So overall, I was able to, to, to show that there is no increase in volatil volatility associated with the activism, and we've got these abnormal returns. So this leads us to something that might be useful, perhaps a trading strategy. So the trading strategy could be as simple as this. Buy firms when you find out that they become targets of hedge funds. Uh, and because the abnormal return in the long term is bigger than the abnormal return you get over the short run, you're going to generate lots of alpha if you follow that, that trading strategy. And as I said several times now, this is abnormal. This is whatever the market's going to give you, you'll get in addition to this is over and above that. And before you all say, well, wait, 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 wait a minute, there's nobody that would come up with a strategy like that for uh, making investments. Um, as it turns out, um, this says March 27th, but IA Clarington Investments launches a fund to invest in active, activist investor targeted companies. So it's invested in, so it's a new product, first of its kind in Canada, that its goal is will invest in companies where an activist investor has disclosed an intention to change or influence management at a target company. So this is, we're going to buy companies that get 13 Ds filed about them. Um, and, uh, and, and it goes on to say that this well-respected uh, manager isn't going to be an activist himself. He's just going to let the activists do what they do. Um, and there was a follow-up article in Financial Post Investment saying that this is a good strategy. This is a good, solid value investing strategy. So, so that's my, my one words of advice, that this is actually not a bad thing to do. But the question is, can we do better than that? And, and the answer is, we should be able to. Um, and, and, and I didn't do it because I was trying to come up with investing strategies. I was trying to understand the nuances of the relationships between these people. But, but I wanted to take a look at what do these target firms look like. Um, and, and the way that I've done my research is, is I've come up with what's called a matched sample. So I don't compare these targets to every other firm that's out there in the universe. What I do is I try to find, I compare them to what I call the five nearest neighbors. So I, 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 I sort firms on, on different attributes. So I, I chose industry, market to book ratio, and market value of equity. So I wanted firms that were similar to compare my targets to. So, so my universe has the 613 samples and then these five nearest neighbors. And when I compare them to those nearest neighbor firms, I find the, the following. First of all, they're actually not bad firms. They have similar, similar, similar levels of accounting profitability, return on assets, return on equity. Uh, but worse yields from, from equity, so stock return and dividends are not as good. 
lower sales growth and lower growth opportunities. This is the value investing side of things or insight of hedge funds coming in. They tend to have better cash flows uh, and they have higher levels of institutional ownership. And then when I compare my targets to the overall companies that are there, not surprisingly, they turn out to be smaller type firms because an activist hedge fund wants to own enough of the firm to make an influence. So it, now I'm not saying it never happens, but it's harder to make your target an S&P 500 firm than it is a smaller cap, cap firm. So, so um, very quickly, just a couple of definitions. First one, my measure of growth opportunities is something called Tobin's Q, or a measure that's close to, to Tobin's Q. And, and I chose something that I could easily get information about, and it's done fairly commonly in the research. And all it is is the ratio of the sum of the book value of debt of the firm to the market value of its equity, all divided by the sum of the book value of both of those things. So, it's, so a higher number tells you that the market's viewing this thing better. So if you have a low Q, um, um, it means that, you, well, it, it, it has some implications we'll talk about it in a second. Sales growth is a pretty straightforward one. This is just your increase in sales over your prior year scales. And then I have institutional, three, three measures of institutional ownership. The first one is just the number of shares in the target that are held by institutional owners. And that's banks and pension funds and all that. And I exclude activist hedge funds from that because I don't want them distorting my results. So all of my definitions of institutional ownership don't include the, the hedge funds. And then I sort those institutional owners as either short-term focused or long-term focused. And I do that in two ways because I want to see if the re results are robust. And the, the first way is fairly straightforward. I just take the institutional type and I broadly classify uh, mutual funds and independent investment advisors as more short-term focused and banks, pension funds, insurance companies, endowments as more long-term focused. And I agree that we could find examples of either that would fall into the other. But in general, I think people would agree that that's not a bad approach. The second one I do is I look at the trading history of, of, um, of the firms that invest in the target. So, so no, I, I, of the institutional investors. So I look at how fast they turn over their portfolios based on their filings with the SEC. And I define uh, a company as being short-term focused if they turn their portfolio over more than the, the median level of turnover that you get. So, so my long-term focused have low turnover, my, uh, my short-term focused have high turnover. Uh, and the two of the, those two add up to this institutional ownership. So I have two approaches and the results end up being consistent between the two. So this is the first one. We clearly see that hedge funds target firms that have higher levels of all three classifications of institutional ownership. Uh, and it's a pretty high level. So 60% or just under 60% of the shares in target firms uh, of active investors are owned by institutional ownership. Compared to my comparator firms, my five nearest neighbors, it's a big difference. That one is clearly statistically significant. And I get the, the same type of result for both short-term focused and long-term focused. But note that the level of short-term focused institutional ownership at these targets is higher than the longer-term focus. So, so this is just looking at sort of what is the results. I was then also interested in is what is it that the, the hedge funds actually prefer um, in their targets? And, and there was a number of things that they preferred. And I, and I do what's called probe regression analysis. But what it's allowing me to do is to figure out what is the likelihood that a firm will be a target. So, so you can kind of think of my sample. I said I've got the target firms and I've got five uh, nearest neighbor firms. So, so in my sample, one out of six firms is going to be a target, right? So, so the chance in my sample of being a target is one in six or about 16%. So what I found is they like hedge funds prefer firms that have lower Q. So, uh, and, and what this change in probability that I'm signaling is, is that if I if I lower the Q by one standard deviation, as it turns out, then I get an increase in likelihood of a firm being a target of 2.7%. 
So to put that in perspective for you, let's look at this higher I.O. number. So we get a 4% change. So if a firm has higher level of institutional ownership, if I increase the level of institu institutional ownership by one standard deviation, the chance of that firm being a target goes up by 4%, and that's 4 on 16.7. So that's about a 25% increase in the likelihood of, of this firm being a target. That's a big deal. So, so these are strong predictors of what kind of firms are going to be going to be targets. And what we find is, is the, the following, is that that on a statistically significant basis and an economically meaningful level, low growth opportunities, low levels of historic sales growth, higher levels of institutional ownership, and higher levels of institutional ownership with a short-term focus all contribute to the likelihood of a firm being a target. So what are the implications of this? Um, the results with respect to the Tobin's Q and the sales growth highlight that hedge funds tend to be value type investors. If you were to go trolling, looking for firms that you might want to buy, one of the screens you might do be would be to look for low Q firms. Because if those low Q firms get their acts together, then the share price is going to go up. And, and that's exactly what, what the hedge funds are doing, but we could do that in this room as well. But what people really haven't looked at is, is this institutional side of things. Um, the I.O. result has the following implication. Um, it says that, that the activist, in ge activist agendas in general are focused on value creation. And I say that for the following reason. If, if hedge funds knew that they were just manipulative um, and that they weren't going to create value for anybody except for themselves, they were looking for a short-term uh, increase in price so they could sell their holdings and make a quick buck, then they would avoid institutional owners because institutional owners are sophisticated. They're smart enough to realize what's going on uh, and they would react to the arrival of the hedge fund by selling off and putting downward pressure on the price. So it would work against them to, to try to buy them. However, if, if the flip side is true, if, if uh, hedge funds are indeed value creating, then they would want to have institutional investors on board because there was because if, if the hedge fund is trying to enact agendas that for whatever reason the institutional investor can't do by itself, then there's a high likelihood that the institutional investor would support what the hedge fund is doing. So, so the results for, for the institutional ownership are consistent with creation of value. And then the, the short-term result is it tells us something about um, about things that the, the hedge funds are looking for. Um, and there's quite a famous paper, uh, academic paper on this, that shows that, that hedge funds decide to buy in, that the act of them deciding to engage in the activism is triggered by a liquidity sell-off of an instit institutional owners. And those liquidity traders tend to be ones who are sh more short-term focused. So for whatever reason, they need to sell a big block of shares. The hedge funds take advantage of the prices associated with that to buy in. Um, another reason they might like to have short-term investors inside, we saw from the CP example and from overall from my results that hedge funds continue to increase their ownership position over time after their initial place. They want liquidity in that, in that target firm stock and they're more likely to have liquidity if there are short-term institutional investors that are there. So there are a number of reasons why they might have this preference for the short-term uh, institutional investors. So this leads us to a, sort of an enhanced or a change in the strategy that you, that you might take. Um, so, so if you're trying to get it, take advantage of, of predicting what firms are going to be um, targets of hedge funds. This is analogous of trying to pick who are going to be the M&A targets. If you, if you could come up with a fund and all you did was protect who was going to be a target and buy those firms, you would end up making tons of money in the marketplace. Well, you can use these results to do a bit of a screening to pick some firms that are more likely to become targets of activism. Uh, and what I'm saying is something like the following. Filter your firms by size and return on assets and cash flows to make sure they they fit what the, the sample averages look like. So, so run anything that fits into the category of 15 or 50 to 200 percent of the median value. So you do an initial screen. And then what you do is you sort things into quartiles and you pick the firms that have low quartile Q and sales growth and a high quartile institutional and short term institutional ownership. Uh, and you find ones that fit that category and those are good targets and you buy some of those. And then you look at them and do a bit of a sanity check and make sure 
because sometimes you can do a computer scan and you think you're going to buy firms you really don't want to burn. So, so check to make sure that you wouldn't otherwise not buy them. But if it fits kind of what your gut feel is about firms that you like, buy these. And if they become targets, don't be like me. Hold on for the long-term gain and you'll end up further ahead. And then do what the people from Clarington are doing as well. If you hear about uh, an activist hedge fund getting involved with a firm that didn't meet your screen, buy it because you're going to get some alpha over the next two years if you do that. So, so there's a tra trading strategy that you might try that sort of follows from, from these results. But my purpose of my research wasn't to come up with trading strategies. I just wanted to, this group would be more inclined to want to hear about those. Um, what I was interested in is what, what is this relationship? That is, do hedge funds like traditional institutional investors to be at target firms. And I've shown a pretty strong case that that is indeed the case. Uh, but now I want to know is, is do those institutional investors like, to, like it when the hedge funds arrive? And the answer kind of should be, well, they should because there's abnormal returns. And if the institutional investor is smart about the trading, they can make some money. Um, but it's important to also look at what does happen with, with uh, the trading uh, that goes on by these other institutional investors when they find out that the, the hedge fund arrives. Um, and I use this for a couple of things. It gets the attitudes of the, of the institutional investors and it also helps me build a stronger case that in general hedge funds are value creating. So what we find is that the level of long-term focused institutional investors, whether I measure it by churn rate or by institutional type, they are rock solid. They're there prior to the hedge fund coming along. They hold on and they wait for the long-term gain. And then what I find out is that overall, institutional ownership drops in the year after and then moves back up. But it's entirely driven by the short-term investors taking some profits. And my original argument was going to be that clearly if institutional ownership overall stayed the same or increased after the, institution, after the hedge fund arrived, that would be a strong indicator of, of, uh, of, of the fact that institutional owners liked them and that there was value creation. But I think you'll see when you, you uh, look at the way that they, they trade, that overall we've got a story of a favorable attitude from traditional institutional investors for the hedge funds. These are the long-term investors, steady as a rock. They, they, they have their position. This is two years prior to the activism event. This is the year prior, year after. Um, and then two years after. And what we find is that overall, this drop, although it looks small in the way I portrayed it, it's a statistically significant drop, but it's entirely driven by what's going on with, with the short-term investors. And, and what the, the message is, is that long-term investors like what's going on in general with these agendas, and they, they'll support them and they'll hold on for that long-term capital appreciation that's gonna take place. The short-term investors will cash in. They'll, 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 they'll sell off in response, take advantage of some of those short-term gains, but they return. They come back because the agenda continues for, as we see, a year or two after the initial foray, it's still going on. They come back wanting more profits to come from, from all of this. So overall, the, the contributions that, that come out of this, this line of research. Um, the first one is to the policy debate on the nature of, of hedge funds. And overall, my results are showing value creation is something that takes place in general when hedge funds get involved and implement their agendas. Um, but it, it's probably not surprising that support for hedge fund activism is not universal. Now, proponents are pretty strong. They say, yeah, it's a value-creating activity. But, 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 uh, but the, the critics are pretty quick to come out and say they'll find examples of manipulation uh, or, or one of the strong criticisms are, is that the benefits don't accrue to all of the stakeholders. So, so it's not universal, um, and policymakers all the time are talking about to what degree do we need to regulate things like hedge funds, and particularly in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, it became a, a big calling card to do something about hedge funds. What my results are showing is that overall, they are effective players in the marketplace and they help create value by using governance to influence performance to, to, uh, to drive share price up. So overall, it's, it's a story that they create value. 
The second one is <coughs> to the overall literature on corporate governance. And there's, there's a, a, a broad literature on, on corporate governance. And in principle, what should happen is that, that, uh, that institutional ownership should matter. Um, that when institutions get involved and start to I interact with companies and influence the, the government, by monitoring, that should make the executives at the firm run the business better, and that should translate into improved performance that should come through in increased share price. Um, and, and what we find in the literature is there's lots of examples where we can show that influence is taking place and that there are proposals that are adopted that are governance measures, but where it all kind of falls down a little bit is it's hard to translate that into actually showing that value is created by improved performance and then share price going up. And what this literature shows is that, or what this research shows is that the institutional owners have um, an indirect path, that is by implicitly or explicitly supporting the agenda of activist hedge funds, they are having a meaningful effect on corporate governance issues that are directly translating into improved performance. And then the last thing uh, that is not part of what my dissertation is going to be, but, but this important is that, that that typical Canadians have a vested interest in what's going on with, with hedge funds and, and hedge funds activism. And I say this for the following reason. Um, not too many of us have the wherewithal to be qualified or accredited investors where we invest directly in the hedge funds. But almost everyone has a vested interest in either a life insurance policy or a pension plan or mutual funds. And Hedge funds get involved in two ways. Clearly, my research is showing that institutional owners, who are the, the pension funds and the mutual funds and the, um, and the insurance companies, have a vested interest in, in and actually work with the, the, the hedge funds to implement these agendas. Um, and then the other side of the way that it comes in is those same institutional firms that's managing your mutual fund or your pension plan are looking to increase their overall returns and to minimize their amount of risk by directly investing in hedge funds themselves. And as I say, in the U.S., institutional investors own about 60% of the, of the interest in, in hedge funds. And it's, I'm... Uh, and that's probably a pretty good number all the way around. So there's a, a number of, of contributions. So overall, for the good of not only my research, but for typical Canadians who care about pensions and things like that, I'm finding that there is a friends, not foes relationship between our activists and our other institutional investors. With that, I thank you very much. <laughs>